Morning Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Ghana's president denies that talks among coalition partners on a prime ministerial candidate are stalled. Our top story in Caribbean Newsline from Monday, October 28th. From the CMC News Center in Bridgetown, I'm Don Paris. Good evening. President David Granger is adamant that talks continue between the a Partnership for National Unity, APNU, and its coalition partner, the Alliance for Change, AFC, over the selection of a prime ministerial candidate ahead of next year's polls. And he says there's no breakdown in their discussions, as some claim. Granger says the partners have appointed teams that are examining a three-stage process, with stage two almost complete. And he noted that discussions between them are taking place every week. Granger also put to rest any concern that the parties might go their separate ways to contest the March 2, 2020 general and regional elections. He insisted that the coalition remains strong and the parties will head into the polls together. Nothing has stalled. We appointed two teams. The AFC appointed a team and APNU appointed a team. And the teams are negotiating. We have an agreement that should the teams hit a wall, the issues uh, which cause any stalling would be referred to the respective party leaders. Nothing has been referred to me um, indicating that there is a problem. I don't understand that people could use a word like stall when discussions are taking place every week. I am very confident that if a matter comes up that is so important that an agreement cannot be reached at the level of the teams which are currently engaged in talks, those issues could be parked and referred to the leaders. That is the agreement. So the question of stalling doesn't or should not arise. And President Granger is predicting that the coalition will be re-elected. His administration was defeated in a vote of no confidence by opposition in a motion led by opposition leader Barrett Jagdeo last December. And the Guyana Elections Commission is now in the process of preparing for the polls. The president says citizens should place the country's fate in his hands because he represents a broad coalition that welcomes parties that share common ideas and people who are prepared to work for the common good wherever they come from. Granger is expected to face the People's Progressive Party civics candidate Irfan Ali in the election for the post of president, but he says he's not worried about his opponent. What I am trying to say is that Mr. Ali represents a different mindset. It's a mindset that has a, a large A different following. ideology. I represent an inclusive ideology. I represent the Big Ben Ab. I represent bringing people from all of the geographic regions I'm the one who set up these four towns to serve the people. I'm the one running a six-party coalition. He is telling people, if you want to serve, come into the PPP. I'm not telling anybody to join the PPP, PNC. I'm telling them to come into a big Benab where their views will be listened to and where the interests of their constituents will be satisfied. Well, President Granger was speaking there to Gordon Monsley on the podcast Inside Source. The Premier of Nevis, Mark Brantley, says the Caribbean's financial services sector is losing business because of new regulations being enforced by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Addressing the annual convention of the Barbados Labour Party on Sunday, he pointed to continued demands from the OECD for countries in the region to tighten their international tax laws to avoid being blacklisted. Brantley also likened the organization's moves to new efforts at colonial domination and warned that the region's hard-won, hard-fought-for independence is being eroded. In my own little Nevis, we have seen a 30% reduction in new financial services business this year due to our amendments to the financial service legislative framework to pacify Brussels. 
The evidence will suggest that business lost is not fleeing to other parts of the world. It is fleeing to states in the United States, such as Delaware and Nevada, which are immune from the reach of the EU, the FATF, the OECD, and others. There is, my friends, no level playing field and no effort to ensure that all are required to play by the same rules. Each cycle of demands by the EU, by the FATF, by the OECD, and others results in a capitulation of small countries like ours. Each capitulation leads to greater and more onerous demands. Grenada's Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell is calling on labor leaders to be more considerate in their demands for salary increases, particularly as it relates to public sector workers. Addressing the convention of his ruling New National Party in St. Patrick's on Sunday, he said it was necessary for wage negotiations to be undertaken within the constraints of the fiscal responsibility legislation. Roadwork, the major roadwork we're embarking on is coming from the soft money that we're getting. We, the monies that we're now increasing for house repair, if we go and give it to one group of persons, we won't have it there, sisters, to help those workers. The seed program has to be increased as some of our elder citizens and some of our handicapped persons in our society need more government help. The $200 they're getting, some of them can't live on it. So we should be talking about increasing it. So we can be talking about giving more to some of us can afford to continue to live. Not, I say again, if the monies are there, we should give everybody a lot more. The Haitian government has condemned attacks on foreign embassies in the capital on Sunday during opposition street demonstrations to force President Jovenel Moïse out of office. Protesters calling for his resignation burnt tires in front of the Canadian embassy, burnt a vehicle near the embassy, and sought to torch a branch of the Unibank by setting fire to an ATM. There were similar attempts to burn down buildings in other parts of the country. Police fired tear gas and bullets into the air in a bid to disperse demonstrators. Some of the protesters were also demanding increased salaries and better working conditions. In a statement, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs condemned the attacks on the diplomatic missions and apologized to the ambassadors of Canada and France. And the Ministry of Justice and Public Security said it has already instructed police to open an investigation to ensure those responsible for the acts are arrested and charged. Over in Trinidad and Tobago, the head of the Islamic Front is calling on the Keith Rowley administration to ensure Trinidadians who are still in detention camps in Syria are brought home. We get more in this CNC3 News report. Photos emerged recently showing the inhumane conditions that the Trinidadian wives and children are made to endure. Imam Umar Abdullah says their lives are in a precarious position as the security situation there deteriorates daily following the withdrawal of American troops. They're starving, they're fearful for their lives because remember these, uh, these individuals who have escaped, um, they are pro-ISIS people on the ground mm -hmm. and if they, they they know these women and children who have who have spoken out against isis so if they see them on the outside they, they, they they're most likely going to be killed there is a possibility that some of our nationals could be sold as slaves to other countries like iran and, and, and so on isn't the government thinking about this what about the persons who the family members who are in trinidad look at that woman who was crying last night on television look at the hurt Mr. Abdullah says the Islamic Front, as well as the families of those people, currently are exploring their legal options. Concerning government's failure to repatriate TNT nationals, he told us it's not clear exactly how many TNT nationals are trapped in Syria, since figures fluctuate between 25 and 90. But he's questioning why government maintains it does not know exactly how many people are still over there. He's also calling on the Foreign Affairs Ministry to be proactive. When anyone were is killed in Syria. The special branch here, they visit the family almost immediately and informs the family of what took place in Syria with their, with their family or their relative, as the case may be. Um, it's surprising that the government will know this and have this information. And they're coming and telling the nation that they are unaware of the numbers and they're unaware of who 
uh, the individuals there and so on. They were given, uh, since in 2017, they were being given the names and a list of names and so on. Families have been contacting the Ministry of National Security on a continuous basis, all right, and been calling upon the, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and nothing serious has been done. Still to come, higher welfare payout among Independence Day announcements in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That story and more after the break. Stay with us. Brittany Dixon, and you're watching Finding Fit, the show where I pair up one client with two trainers. Trainer number one. Oh my gosh. It's about fitness, comedy. You know, I could do this all day, you know. Drama. Um, in the future, we cannot be late. Inspirational stories and so much <gasps> more. You are going to love it. You can catch Finding Fit prime time this fall on Care Vision. Residents of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Monday enjoyed a public holiday in celebration of the nation's 40th anniversary of political independence from Britain. And at a military parade in Kingstown on Sunday, the actual day on which the Independence Day fell, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez made several announcements. CMC's Kenton Chance has the details. <laughs> An increase in the monthly payout to welfare recipients topped the list of 20 announcements by Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez as St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Sunday marked 40 years of independence from Britain. From January 2020, the monthly public assistance paid to the poor and vulnerable persons numbering 4,900 will be increased by $25. Thus, the recipients who are over 65 years of age will be paid $275 monthly and those under 65 $450 monthly. Our prof profound commitment to the poor continues. Gonzalez also said he expects that next year the minimum pension paid by the state owned national insurance services will be increased after the usual review. The Prime Minister also announced that his government will pay in December $1 million in allowances owed to nurses and nursing assistants. The final batch of 100 teachers awaiting graduate appointments having completed university degrees will be so appointed. Gonzales told the thousands of persons who attended the parade in Kingstown that public servants who have obtained university degrees will be similarly appointed. The Prime Minister's announcements included the distribution of letters for the acquisition of titles to state lands and that several government projects intended to improve public infrastructure will begin soon. These include a public access to village enhancement, PAVE, program. Gonzalez also announced a $3 million road cleaning program for November and that $1.3 million from the Medical Marijuana Authority will go to assisting traditional marijuana growers who have been licensed to transition into the legal cannabis industry. Taiwan is providing a shipment of 5,160 sacks of fertilizer. 
The fertilizer will be distributed to farmers at highly subsidized prices to boost further agriculture production. Taiwan will also provide a U.S. $20 million soft loan for the construction of a parliament and courthouse complex. The Prime Minister said that four Vincentian historians will be contracted to produce a government-funded textbook on the history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The announcements also included the yearly editions of cultural and sports ambassadors, as well as duty-free concessions on Christmas barrels and packages. Kenton Chance, CMC News, Kingstown, St. Vincent. The Pan-American Health Organization, PAHO, says ultra-processed foods, sugary beverages, and fast food with poor nutritional quality are replacing nourishing foods in the Caribbean. It's, that's contained in a recently published report. And Marie Claire Williams has the details in this week's Newsline Health. The PAHO report says sales of ultra-processed foods and beverages grew by 8.3% between 2009 and 2014. It also estimates that those sales grew a further 9.2% from 2014 to 2019. PAHO's regional advisor on nutrition, Fabio De Silva Gomez, says they are observing the beginnings of an epidemic of ultra-processed food consumption. He noted that sales are growing disproportionately in comparison to those with other foods, filling family tables with products that do not contribute to good health. According to him, this trend is promoted by the marketing and unrestricted publicity of these products in a market that is practically deregulated in the region. And PAHO is calling on governments to set policies that restrict the sales of those foods. The report added that ultra-processed foods typically contain little or no whole foods. They include soft drinks and other sugar-sweetened juices and drinks, sweet and savory snacks, candies, industrial breads, cakes and cookies, sweetened breakfast cereals, reconstituted meat products, and pre-prepared dishes. A previous PAHO report on ultra-processed products revealed that the increase in sales was associated to an increase in body weight, which indicates that these products are an important driver of the growing rates of overweight and obesity. In the region, some 360 million people, or almost 60% of the population, are overweight. Marika Williams, Newsline Health. Ahead in sport, a cricket legend says long-term planning is key to the West Indies revival. We'll be back. Let your spirit take to flight. Let your heart run free wild. Find your soul in Dominica. The nature of The thing to keep in mind is that when Statements like some of the ones in the previous segment were made, um, I think those make Trump's base excited and they double down on him. So I think it'll have an interesting effect. I don't think it's going to make anybody change their mind. I think the economy is the key to all this. I don't think it's a coincidence that as we start to whisper about a potential recession, people are really then starting to drum up. <laughs> Uh, let me go to Voltage because Voltage is new. So let me ask Voltage, what is the worst date you ever went out on? Well, I met this girl on Instagram, right? Instagram? Yeah. We had a thing going. So, like, we talk for, like, um, When you think of what we went through with Hurricane Irma, you had to be able to recognize what are the things we need to do to cope with the aftermath. 
the psychological trauma to me is probably the most telling on a lot of people. Preparedness is the key. So when people are prepared, when people have the they have the, what their resources in terms of how they can cope with the disaster, they're better able to be able to uh, return to their normal life. They're better able to make decisions that are informed for themselves and for their family and then for their community. Be ready. Look, listen, and link. Legendary former Test captain and master batsman Sir Vivian Richards believes West Indies cricket has reached a crossroads and he says strategic long-term planning by Cricket West Indies will be paramount if the sport is to rebound in the region. Pointing to the Caribbean side's disastrous performance at the ICC World Cup in England earlier this year and their steady slide down the rankings, Sir Viv said the team's struggles had reached a new low. Speaking on the Line and Length Cricket podcast, Sir Viv said some planning is needed for a turnaround. We are basically at the crossroads where our cricket um, is concerned. Uh, I think um, we, um, we need to, 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 to get up the ratings we need and we've got to find ways and means of, um, of, of doing that. Um, the, the, the planning factor, uh, not just basically for the, the, the series that we have ahead and the tournaments ahead, but also for uh, the future. And these are things we, 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 we got to take in mind. Meantime, he has endorsed Chiron Pollard's appointment as a white ball skipper and believes politics within the last administration of the regional game prevented him from being given the position sooner. The 32-year-old Pollard was elevated to the position last month and next week faces his first challenge when the Caribbean men take on Afghanistan in India from November 5th to 18th in three ODIs and three T20s. He replaced all-rounder Jason Holder as one-day captain and all-rounder Carlos Brathwaite at the helm of the T20 squad. He should have been, in my opinion, a bit earlier against the politics with the last regime and the things that obviously went down in India. Uh, there are some of these guys, in my opinion, were blacklisted from um, maybe playing the role that they should help him to move the team forward. And I think because of those political issues, uh, didn't quite help um, the, the, the progress. Well, Saviv said he had identified leadership qualities in Pollard from as early as 2013 when he saw him in the Inc in the inaugural CPL season. In my opinion, the best captain, you know, um, no disrespect to, 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 to folks like Carlos and things like that. Carlos is a very highly competitive you know, individual, uh, would have won us a World Cup off his back the, 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 the last outing, but um, he was put in a position because of those political reasons, and I think he would understand that, understand that as well because I think he's a, a very sensible and knowledgeable and, in my opinion, have an idea what it's all about. So um, no, no issues with, um, with, with Karen Pollard. Uh, I believe that uh, he brings uh, the inventiveness. Uh, I, I think he, 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 um, he's proactive more than anything else, which I think can help at times. West Indies women leading opener Haley Matthews has been left out of a 14-member squad to face touring India women in the first two one-day internationals of the three-match series which rolls off in Antigua on Friday. The 21-year-old Barbadian was suspended last month, just days before the start of Australia's tour of the Caribbean, for what Cricket West Indies described as a breach of its code of conduct. The matter was subsequently referred to the CWI Disciplinary Tribunal, but there has been no word on the outcome. CMC Sports understands Matthews is still not eligible to return to the side. The right-hander, who bowls a steady off-spin, has become a fixture in the international side and was a member of the squad which captured the T20 world title in India three years ago. 
Without her services, West Indies looked a shadow of themselves against Australia recently, suffering a 3-0 whitewash in both the one-day and T20 series. Fast bowler Shakira Selman, who missed the Australia series with injury, is again sidelined, while no room has been found for her usual new ball partner, Shamilia Connell, who managed just three wickets in six matches against the Aussies recently. Selectors have replaced them with uncapped seamer Shanisha Hector and fast bowling all-rounder Aliyah Aline. The side will be led by Stefani Taylor and includes an experienced all-rounder Stacey Ann King and Brittany Cooper, with Shadeen Nation and Shemaine Campbell returning to the side after missing the Australia series through injury. Highly rated all-rounder Deandra Dotton has still not returned to full fitness following surgery earlier this year and she was not considered. Teenage Guyanese pace bowler Shabika Gajnabi and 21-year-old off-spinner Shanetta Grimmond, both of whom debuted last against Australia last month, have retained their spots. Newly appointed lead selector Anne Brown John, who was previously the team manager, said the squad was a good balance of youth and experience. The opening two ODIs will be played on November 1st and 3rd at the Vivian Richards Cricket Stadium, with the final game scheduled for the same venue on November 6th. Bermuda's Flora Duffy raced a victory in the Xterra World Championship in Maui on Sunday, becoming the first elite athlete to win five Xterra World Championships. Xterra consists of swimming, mountain biking and trail running over some rugged and challenging terrain. And the 32-year-old Duffy led from start to finish, crossing the line in a winning time of 2 hours, 1 minute, 33 seconds, comfortably ahead of Leslie Patterson of Scotland in 2 hours, 10 minutes and 54 seconds, and American Susie Snyder in 2 hours, 13 minutes and 11 seconds. Duffy won the title from 2014 to 2017 before a foot injury forced her to relinquish her crown. She will now sign off for a month before returning to Bermuda next month, and then she'll head to South Africa, where she will begin her preparations for the Olympic Games in Tokyo next summer. She has her heart set on winning the triathlon gold medal, having finished a disappointing eighth in the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro. Retired Jamaican sprint star Usain Bolt has received the 2019 Humanitarian Award by the American Friends of Jamaica Boat was one of two Jamaicans awarded at the Hummingbird Gala in New York for their philanthropic work, the other being businessman Glenford Christian. And that's the sport. We'll be right back. Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. So we are ready to go here and we are doing the cloves and the spice a bit different. We're not going to be adding that directly to the worm celly. What we are doing is that we're going to bring some water to boil here. The same water we're going to use to boil the worm celly, but we're going to put it to boil aside and add the cloves and the spice in there to get Maria weakened slightly after crossing Dominica, but soon achieved its peak intensity over the Eastern Caribbean. Maximum sustained winds of 175 miles per hour, making it the 10th most intense Atlantic hurricane on record. I lose two girls in York from here. Yeah, right here. My first daughter died right here. The reverse came down and we had a shock here. Yeah.
Again, the major developments of this day, Ghana's president denies that talks among coalition partners on a prime ministerial candidate are stalled. And in sport, legendary former test captain Sir Viv Richards says West Indies cricket has reached a crossroads and a strategic long-term plan is key to the sport rebounding in the region. And that's Caribbean News Line for news and sport around the clock. Subscribe to CarnoNews.com. And for more of our programming, log on to Caravision.tv and check out our YouTube channel. We'll be back here again tomorrow, but from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching and have yourselves a good night.